Okay, let's uh, let's do some one sixteen. So, uh, before I, I guess uh, I always feel weird just diving into things. So I'll still open with this. Um, maybe I'll stop doing this after a while. But if anybody has any quick questions, anybody wants to get things started, otherwise I'll um, dive into some content. Stacks and cues today, baby. Thought the GA was pretty fun. Oh yeah. yeah especially yeah, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, doing the genetic algorithm and specifically the the expansion objective, the neural network. If you're interested in machine learning and things like that, it's uh it's a good one. Yeah, the GA I, I've said this on other channels, but I haven't said that this in the main lecture before. The genetic algorithm, you probably won't see that again. It's not its not a very practical algorithm. It is a glorified guess and check. So once you get into the more advanced stuff, you'll throw away the genetic algorithm. But neural networks, they're still used. Deep neural networks, are the, that's like the hot new thing right now. Uh, not too new, but that's the hot thing. Where deep neural networks, if you did the neural network for the homework, a, a deep neural network is adding more hidden layers, nodes of hidden layers, and it more accurately... Um, simulates basically a human brain. Human brains, they say, have are simulated with like six layers, but that's a little off topic. Um, one announcement I do have is I made a post on Piazza for labs. Uh, labs will, the first lab section will be tonight at 6 p.m., 6 to 8, uh, and then tomorrow's the big lab day every Thursday. So take a look at that post. That's where our, it's the second. We had an office hours update, so it's not the first one anymore, but it's the second pinned post on piazza so take a look at that um and make sure you don't miss this week's lab if you contact me on friday and make a piazza post oh i didn't know lab was happening no sympathy here i'm mentioning it in lecture um you know and, and it's on piazza uh we do have to keep up on piazza everybody has to keep up on piazza because that's my main way of sending announcements to you that's where uh that's kind of like the central hub of the course right now so if you're not checking that and you're not watching lectures, you know, it's, there's nothing more I can do for you. College courses for high school students. Oh, AP. Yeah. All right. So let's, uh, so let's talk about this. Stacks and cues. Let's go. So the lecture question today is to, uh, is to implement a, uh, like a backlog um, simulator to be able to have a backlog of things that need to get done and be able to take care of those tasks one at a time. This is... Uh, an application and a simulation of a queue. So you have tasks that enter your backlog into the back of the backlog, and um, and it's a what we call a first in first out data structure. Whatever is the task that's been sitting in your backlog the longest, that's the next task that you do when you have some time to uh, to accomplish that backlog. So the backlog is going to take some type parameter a, which is the the type of task that's being backlogged, and some function. It takes in an A and returns a unit, which is the function that's going to be called, which means like actually doing the work. When that function is called on something of type A, that means you're completing that task. We also have an add task method, which is going to add to the uh, a task of type A to the back of the queue, and a complete task method, which is going to complete the task at the front of the queue. Whatever task has been waiting the longest to be done, that's the task that needs to be completed which means you're going to call this function on that task and then also remove it from your uh, from the backlog. So this is the implementation we want. Today's lecture, we're going to talk about stacks and queues. In lecture, I'm going to give an example of a stack. And then for the queue, that's going to be the lecture question. Uh, you'll be working with something that behaves like a queue. You can build this queue however you'd like, uh, but we want to get that functionality of a queue that, with that in queue and DQ functionality. Lecture questions get hate for no reason. Oh, hey, on lecture questions. Yeah, you only need to attend one lab section, but you can choose whichever one you want. But you can only choose one. The link will be on Piazza, not the website. Uh, I've been shipped into Piazza for most everything with the course, just because everything's so much in flux right now that uh that there's uh you know things are moving around too much um 
I'm not going to update the server every single time. I want it on Piazza so we can update quicker, more effectively, and also so every TA can update. So I want things on Piazza for a while. Once things settle down, I might start shifting things to the course website again. But the course website has some out-of-date information, specifically the office hours schedule. I'm keeping my office hours the same, but the, a lot of the TAs are, are shifting theirs around as their schedules change. So uh, Piazza is the place to go for all the latest information and all the everything that you need. Piazza is the new central hub of the course instead of the course website. All right, stacks and queues. Let's start talking about it. So stacks and queues are, uh, uh, I'm a little opinionated about stacks and queues. It'll probably come out in this lecture, but, uh, um, but we'll get to that. These, uh, these data structures are, uh, have less functionality than other data structures that we'll use. And, uh, they have less functionality by design. These are data structures with a restricted feature set that intentionally locks down some functionality that's inefficient. The idea of stack and queues is everything that you can do with a stack or queue is very efficient. And by that, I mean, O of one runtime. Everything is very efficient with stack and queue. And Scala does have built-in stack and queue classes uh, if you want to use those. The queue is useful. The stack is not um, not so much. Uh, the stack class in Scala, if you look at the documentation, the implementation of the stack class, right inside that class, there's a comment that says, why are you using this? You shouldn't be using this class. It's a, it's a silly thing to do. And we'll talk about why that's a silly thing. Uh, though, though that's the crux of it right there. A stack, uh, stacks and queues are both built using linked lists, and we're going to see how they're both built using linked lists. A stack is built using, at least in Scala, an immutable linked list, and queues are built using mutable linked lists. But if you're using a stack, why not just use a list in Scala instead of using a stack, is the argument. A stack is just a, a list, a, an immutable linked list, uh, with some of the features restricted. So why not just use the list class and then use it responsibly and be aware of when you're using an expensive operation? That's the argument for, for that. Um, so let's talk about what these even are. So what is a stack? A stack is, uh, is what we call a last in first out data structure. And we can think of this as the stack of papers or you know a stack of bananas as y'all wanted to say last time. Uh, as long as you could stack the bananas in a stack form, that'd be fine. Um, but more commonly, a stack of papers or a stack of folders in this case. You can access the top of the stack. You can add elements to the top of the stack, and you can remove the top element of the stack. And that's it. That's all you can do with the stack. You can only interact with the, uh, with the value that's on the top of the stack. You cannot jump to the middle and grab this folder. You can't jump to the bottom and grab this folder. You can only interact with the top uh, of the stack which is going to be the head of the linked lists in our examples. So you can only work with the top of the stack. And then the, uh, the last value that was added to the stack is going to be the top. That's going to be the first one out if we're popping off of the stack. So that's how we get our last in. Whatever the last thing you put on the stack, that's going to be the first one that comes out when you interact with this stack again. <laughs> can I teach the rest of the semester in bananas? Yeah, sure. Uh, it might get old after a while. It's probably old after today, actually. Uh, but hey, if the people want it. Uh, so stack uh, can have three methods. The way I said it in the last slide, I said three methods, but really just two methods that we need to have a stack. Push and pop. Push is going to add an element to the top of the stack. Pop is going to remove that top element. Some, some implementations in some languages are going to have a third method, um, usually called peak, which lets you view the top element without removing it from the stack. If you just want to see what's on the top of the stack without removing it from the stack, you could have uh, a peak method too. We're not going to mess with that today. We're just going to do push and pop, the minim absolute minimum that we need. And then if you want to view the top element, you would pop it, view it, and then push it back on to the stack. So we could still have that functionality. Uh, here's, a, here's my implementation of a stack using our linked list node from the last lecture. So with a, a linked list, we have our linked list. Each uh, node of a linked list knows its value that it's responsible for and also has a reference to the next node in the linked list. To build a stack, we're going to have one linked list node, which is going to be the top of the stack initialized to null. So we initialize this to an empty stack. And, um, and we're going to be able to add 
to this linked list, which we're going to prepend the new value to the linked list. So we're going to say the top, whatever was the top, is going to be now a new linked list node, which, uh, which has this new value that we're adding and has a reference to the old top of the list. So if this is the first element to be pushed onto the stack, we're going to have a new linked list node with that value that we're pushing with a reference to null, and that's going to be the new top of the stack. If it's the second one, we're going to have a new linked list node that refers to this node and has that new value that we're pushing onto the stack again. So we can always add to the front of the, the top of the stack by prepending to our underlying linked list. Uh, if we want to pop, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to grab the value of that top element, whatever the top element of the stack is or the head of the linked list. We're going to take that value store it so we know what to return, uh, store it temporarily, update the top to be a reference to the top's next, and then we're going to return it. And if you notice, this pop method is actually going to crash your program if you try to pop off of an empty stack, which is uh, common. We uh, we really should throw an exception. It's some, uh, I, I might add to the course at some point, uh, obviously not this semester, but it, we should throw an exception, say uh, pop off an empty stack exception throw that exception and let somebody be able to handle that error. Um, with this implementation, we're just going to crash the program. We're going to get, if uh, we pop off an empty list, top is null, we're going to say null.next, null pointer exception, program crashes. So just a, a side note, uh, this isn't a very robust implementation of a stack. I just want to talk about the theory of a stack. Ooh. Mm -hmm. So if we have this stack, once we have that stack from the previous slide, we can create a new stack just using our constructor. It's going to create an empty stack. We can push values onto the stack. We can pop values off of the stack, get those elements, and treat this just like a stack of ints. If we have, uh, uh, we want to think of this as just a stack of ints. I put three on the stack. I put seven on top of three. I put two on top of five, put negative five on top of two. And then I want to pop negative five off of that stack. Element is going to store the int negative five. And the stack is going to be three at the bottom, then seven, then two at the top. Um, we don't have to, with this abstraction, we don't have to think that a stack is represented by a linked list. We don't have to think about those implementations. It's one of the nice things about abstraction and object-oriented programming. We don't have to care how the stack is implemented. We just care about its API. I can create an empty stack. I have API methods push and pop that I can use, and the implementation happens to give me the functionality that I want by using a linked list, but we don't have to care that it's a linked list. So this is the, from the user side, this is what they would see. From our, from the developer side, we're going to see the actual implementation of that linked list, of the nodes, of the linking of the nodes, and, uh, and the references. We have to be aware of all that. Uh, we can use Scala's list as a stack. And this is, um, I alluded to this earlier, here's where I really want to talk about it. Uh, this is how, uh, at least I would prefer to use a stack, is I would just use a list and use that list as a stack and uh, treat it as a stack and use prepend for push and then um, uh, grab the head of the list. I can always view the head, the first the element, the top element of the stack or the head of the list. And then I can always pop by dropping one off the list or saying stack equals stack dot tails also does the same thing as drop one. Drop one drops, uh, deletes one element, drops the uh, this many elements from the list and gives you a new list with that many elements removed or reference to that list. If you have yeah the latency that sucks if you're having uh, a lot of issues there if if it's too much uh, you can always watch the vods it sucks you can't uh, get the live experience though uh, so this is so I would prefer this way if you understand how your linked lists work which uh, after these couple of lectures I'm hoping that's every single one of you. That you understand how your linked lists work and know that if you prepend, you're going to have an O of 1 operation. 
And if you drop from the left of the linked list or from the head of the linked list, that's also an O of 1 operation. And getting the head of the list, these are all O of 1 operations. As long as you're aware of that and aware of how your, how your uh, lists work, uh, this is the preferred way because then if you do ever need more functionality, if you need the apply method, for example, you want to see what the second element of your stack is, you can just say apply of two and get that, have that functionality or apply of one rather and get that functionality uh, from the list. If you use the stack class, Scala's built-in stack class or the stack class that we just built, if you use that stack class, you don't have that option. You have push and pop and that's it. You can't do anything else. Uh, so you're restricting yourself and what you can do just to get this this API that's restricted to only have efficient um, efficient operations. Um, so I would prefer to use the list and then just pretend it's a stack. Uh, however, in uh, in a lot of interviews, you're likely to be asked about stack and heap. So you have to understand what a stack and heap is, what the terminology push and pop in Q and DQ that we're going to see. You have to be aware of what that terminology is because you're likely to be asked that stuff in interviews. So uh, so we do have to still talk about stack and queue explicitly. But in practice, using a list like this or with a queue using a mutable list would be uh, would just be fine. Today's lecture question might be too easy. A lot of the lecture questions are too easy. But, uh, but they still cause enough trouble that uh, I'm not concerned about raising the difficulty. For the lecture question, we can use you can use a list. Yeah, you can even use a mutable list if you want. There's no restrictions anymore at this part of the class. All right, so so let's take a look at what's happening on the heap when we're using a stack. So if we have this list that we saw, this is the the code that we saw on the previous slide. We're going to create a new list, an empty list, which is going to be a pointer to null. I mean, that's not how it's represented in a Scala list, but let's uh, let's use the power of our imagination for now. Uh, null has, uh, is actually a, a reference to the nothing class, um, but we don't have to get into, we don't have to go to, into that. Uh, so we have an empty list. We're going to prepend three, prepend seven, prepend two, prepend negative five. And as we do that, since we're always prepending, we have that, that case that we had, um, that we had last time. When we prepend to a list, we're not changing this underlying list at all. This, what's in red, when we have this built right after this line and we prepend negative five, we don't have to change a single thing inside this box to prepend negative five. So if somebody else, somewhere else in this program, we have a reference to this node in this original, this list right here, somebody has a reference to this node as a list when we prepend negative five, we return a reference to this node right here. This returns a reference to the node with negative five, this new node that was created. And that reference to the new node is our new stack. But everything in this box is unchanged. So this is how we can get a mutable, or, or sorry, an immutable linked list, but still have a lot of efficiency. We did not have to copy all of these elements we did not have to make a copy of this list in the red box when we prepended negative five we just uh, anybody with a reference to this node still has the list 273 but we are reusing that list 273 but also have the value negative five prepended to the beginning so we have effectively four different lists uh, five if you count the empty list uh, represented in this program right now and depending on what reference you have to what node, it's going to seem like your list has those just those elements. So if I have a reference to this node here, which was created on this line, I have effectively have the list 7, 3. And I'm not affected by this node that happens to point to the head of my list. I just don't care that that node exists and is referring to this list. I have the list 7, 3. This is the list 2, 7, 3. This is the list negative 5, 2, 7, 3. So this is how, even though this list is immutable, we can get this efficiency if we're prepending. If we're prepending to this list, nothing has to change with what's in the red box. Same with when we drop, uh, when we pop off of this stack, we get rid of this node. All we're doing is updating our reference. We were referring to this node, 
Now we can refer to this node. Nothing changed with these nodes. Nothing changed in this list. We just updated which node we happen to be pointing to. So these are both O of 1 operations. Nothing to, uh, to push, create a new node, and just have it point to the old top of the stack. To pop, we just, instead of having a reference to this thing, we move our reference down to its next value. And that's it. If we would append, excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, we we will, uh, uh, it might be the next slide, but we're definitely going to talk about that. That's my, my big lead up is, look at how efficient prepend is. But what about append? Oh, what about append? Uh, so queue, uh, let's talk about queues. This is the other data structure we wanna talk about today. Again, based on linked lists. Uh, but this is a first out, first in, first out data structure. So instead of like a stack of papers, we visualize this as like a queue at an amusement park. Any line that you want to wait for, uh, pistachios line would be a queue. Whoever's first to show up is going to be the first one to be able to get their order placed or ride the ride or whatever. That's our, our first in, first out data structure. Whoever's first to arrive is the first to leave. Whoever's second to arrive is second to leave. And anybody queuing up at the end of a long line they have a long way to wait. Everybody who was queued up before them, they all have to exit the data structure before that person can exit the data structure. So first in, first out, we uh, we have methods in queue and DQ. You in queue at the end of the line and you DQ from the front of the line. <laughs> Pistachio's line is short now, but it wasn't always like that. Um, uh, so we so Q has to have references. Uh, I don't think it's open. Uh, actually, I'm not 100%. I don't think it is, though. Um, so we have to have access to the end and the beginning of the queue with this. With a stack, we only needed to have the top of the stack, a reference to that top element, that top node. With a queue, we have to have the front and back nodes. So the code gets a little bit more complex. Uh, our API is still just a simple two methods, adding data and removing data. But our code is a little more complex just because we had to have references to the beginning and end of the node. And since uh, we don't have a clean way to handle these nulls, the code gets a little bit, you know, it's not as clean as I'd, I'd want it to be. But, you know, this works. So uh, it works for the example. The uh, So I have references to the front and back. They're both initialized at null. When we enqueue an, an element, we want to add to the back of the queue. If the back is null, that means we have an empty list and we got to initialize everything. The front and back are both going to be the single node that we're going to create. We're going to create a new node with that element. That node points to null because it's a, a list with only one element. And the front and back refer, importantly, refer to the same exact node, not just a node with the same value. The front and back are the same node. The uh, That one element is both the front of the queue and the back of the queue. If this queue is not empty, we're going to update our uh, update the back of our queue. The back's next, which is always going to be null. This is the end of a linked list, so back is always referring to null. Um, so update that null. Instead of null, next, we want to be this new linked list node with the value that we're in queuing and pointing to null because this is the new end of the list. And then update back to be back's next. So we're appending, appending, not prepending, appending to the back of a linked list. Uh, DQ, we're going to check that, grab that front element, just like we did with the stack. The front element, uh, get its value so we can return it. Update the next reference to the front. If this is an empty queue, we're going to crash right here. We're going to get a null pointer exception. And if the front is null, so if front.next was null, also update the back to be null. This uh, this would be a tricky bug to debug uh, if you're not if you're not doing this, but you gotta check the front uh, to see if that is the end of the list. If it is, we want to make sure we also update the back of the list. We don't want this dot back still referring to this dot front. If the queue was size one, these are referring to the same element. If the front was just updated to be null, we want to make sure that we blank out the back as well. So we're back to an empty. An empty queue with front and back both being null. So we just want to make sure we have that updated. 
to use a queue, very similar to the stack, except the order is going to be reversed. We in queue three, we in queue seven, we in queue two, we in queue five. Then when we dequeue, we're going to pull three out of the front of the queue and grab that. Yes, queue is for the lecture question. It says right in the lecture question. Thank you. Uh, Scala does have a built-in queue and the queue is built based on a mutable list. The Scala's queue, if you look at the Scala class, maybe during the Q&A we can crack open the code on those and, and check them out. The Scala queue is based on a Scala's mutable list. Just like our list that we're working with is a mutable list, Scala's queue class is going to use a mutable list. With a queue, uh, it's a little more debatable whether you should use the queue class or a mutable list. Uh, you could probably use the mutable list. You know, that, That's going to be up to preference. In that case, I would actually end up using the queue um, just because I don't like importing mutable data structures and working with mutable data structures myself because uh, I get all the mutability issues that can crop up. Oh, man. The mouse wheel moves my slides in this program. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, so you can use Scala's built-in queue or the mutable list or use a list and just be inefficient. It's fine, too. But let's talk about the efficiency of this one. If we have an immutable list, this becomes an issue when we're appending. So with the queue, we have to append values, not prepend them. Uh, or we could flip around the whole list and prepend values, but now we have to dequeue off the end of the stack. At some point, we're going to have to work with both ends of this linked list. I said stack, I meant linked list. We're going to have to work with both ends of the linked list. We can work with the front of a linked list very efficiently. Appending and popping from the, the front, we can do that very efficiently, with a, even with immutable linked lists. With, mutable, uh, with immutable linked lists, whenever we work with the end of the list, we're going to be inefficient. It's going to be O of N operations, and things are going to go uh, get inefficient very, very quickly. So if we have to append to the end of a list, we want to queue this value 3, create a new node, uh, and update that value. Now the old linked list that we had in the red box does have to change. It has to change because this next, inside the red box, this last node, which was referring to a null, now refers to this new node that we just created. We do have to modify the list in the red box. So now somebody with a reference to the head of this list, negative, this node negative, storing negative five, their list just changed on them. We can't allow this with an immutable list. We just can't let that happen. So this means if we want to append to the end of an immutable linked list, we have to copy all these values over. We have to create a whole new list with all of those values and then uh, append that to reflect that change. Uh, uh, to create a brand new linked list with that change applied. We have to copy all those values if we're working at the end of a linked list. So this is very bad for efficiency. It's why the built-in queue uses a, a mutable linked list because there's no good way to get around this with a uh, with an immutable linked list. So a queue working with the end of the list we get a lot of inefficiencies due to this uh, immutability of the, the linked list. So if you have a, a concurrent architecture and you're using a queue, um, you have to have some way, some way of getting around this. If you're using an immutable or a mutable linked list, you have this concurrent write issue. What if two, uh, what if two concurrently running pieces of code want to modify the same queue. They both want to dequeue and pull the first element. We can have some trouble there. Um, we can have some trouble with that functionality. All right, let's, uh, I don't know if I still do this in, in live mode, but let's pause for a second, at least just to digest still. I think the pauses can still be helpful, even though there's questions uh, um, throughout. Let me just catch up on some questions maybe. Real quick, what is a node? I see it there, but I don't know what it means. So a node is any one of these these things. The node here is just a, a label for the node. This is 
back to our oh, what screen is my mouse on? Uh, this is like your lecture question from Monday. This is the linked list node class. The node would be instances of this linked list node class. And all that node has is a value and a reference to the next node. And each one of these uh, nodes are going to be at some place on the heap, but we don't know exactly where, uh, where on the heap. stacker queue yeah it's good uh you can create a new stacker queue and give it a list but yeah it still has to build each node one at a time under the hood uh you so you can use a linked list for today's lecture question so at some level it's going to be a linked list uh, you can use scholars built-in lists you can use the linked list node from lecture you can use the queue class the built-in queue class from Scala. I'm not picky about how you get the job done, but I need you to understand this uh, first in, first out type of data structure type of thinking. Okay, let's let's get on with it. That make a linked list, a list of calls to certain parts of the heap. Um, yeah, you should. Probably take a look at Monday's lecture again. It'll, but to navigate a linked list, like each one of these nodes can be anywhere, wherever we just ended up getting memory on the heap. These are all different places of the heap. And these arrows, this next variable is a reference to another linked list node. And we follow those references. If we want to navigate this entire list, we'll start at this node, check its, uh, do whatever we need to do with the node. Go to next, that's going to give us a new memory address, some other spot in, on the heap. We can do whatever we need to do here, and then follow next, go to a new spot on the heap, do whatever we need to do. Follow next, go to a new spot on the heap, do what we need to do. Go to the next spot, we see it's null, so we know we're done. The linked list is really efficient. It, it also depends on what you're doing. Uh, that's all CC250 territory, when to use which data structure. There are a lot of trade-offs. There's there's no perfect data structure, but they all are good for certain situations. Linked lists are good for stacks and queues. Queues if it's a mutable linked list. Very efficient. Uh, if you try to build stacks and queues with an array, you're going to have all these resizing issues. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be inefficient. But with linked lists, stacks and queues are efficient. Yeah, linked list specifically if your data structure needs to grow and shrink, um, which an array can't do. You have to create new arrays and copy all the values over, over and over. Um, that's uh, that gets really inefficient. A linked list can grow and shrink because you just ask for more heap space and have references to that new heap space. Uh, so let's talk about an application of stacks uh, in kind of queues, but the queue isn't really used so much as a queue. Let's talk about an application of stacks, something that we can do with stacks. So let's take a, a quick sidestep and talk about infix and postfix expressions. Infix, you're used to. This is what you've seen your whole life for algebraic expressions. So we've kind of seen in calculator, except uh, we won't worry about order of operations and things. For this, you have an order of operations. Multiplication and division comes before addition and subtraction. And we use parentheses to override the order of operations at any given time. If we want something to happen before, um, the order of operations would have it happen. Slap some parentheses on there, give it a done deal. You know, just have it uh, done like that. Uh, these parentheses are a little redundant because it doesn't really change anything, does it? Yeah, it doesn't change anything. But these parentheses change the outcome of, uh, of the computation. Right? Does it even? Maybe it doesn't. Oh, well, I don't want to think about it too much. 
<laughs> I, I just threw in some parentheses. Uh, to, to figure out how to evaluate these, we use the PEMDAS rules, parentheses first, then exponentiation, which we don't have any here, then multiplication and division with the same precedence, then addition and subtraction with the same precedence. So we evaluate everything inside the parentheses. We evaluate the inside these parentheses. Following PEMDAS, the division is going to be first. Then inside these parentheses, we'll get 11. Yeah, it would be it'd be positive three if we didn't have that second set of parentheses. So we're we're going to add these values, get the 11, and then get the negative three instead of positive three that we had have if we didn't have these um, these parentheses here. So we're all used to that. That's a, a review of what fifth grade. I don't know when we you know, sixth grade maybe. Um, we have all seen that. Some you probably haven't seen is postfix expressions. So with a postfix expression, we have a different order of writing our operators and operands. And this is, uh, I should have adjusted the kerneling or something, but uh, this is a 12, not a 1 and a 2. A 12, 4, minus 8, 9, 3, division, addition, subtraction. So this is the same expression that we saw on the previous slide, uh, except we don't need any parentheses for this. You'll never have parentheses in a postfix expression. There's no order of operations to consider. Uh, the order of operations is determined by the, just the order in which they appear in the expression. And these two facts make this very easy for computers to read. You can write an algorithm that computes, uh, that evaluates this expression much easier than you could write an algorithm to evaluate the prefix expression. Prefix expression, trying to code all the PEMDAS in there, um, it, you're, you know, it's just a lot to consider. With this, on the next slide, we'll walk through how to evaluate this. There's a very simple, straightforward algorithm to be able to train a computer to be able to evaluate this expression. It's one of its big advantages. The disadvantages, unless you've, you're just used to postfix expression that you, and you've had a lot of practice with these, it's probably pretty hard for you to read what's going on here, what this expression actually is. To evaluate this, the algorithm, you read values until you reach an operator. Once you reach an operator, you read the previous two values, which are going to be operands because you read until you found an operator. The operator you're evaluating is always the first operator in the expression. So you take the previous two values, those are your operands, and you evaluate that expression. So we evaluate 12 minus four, that's going to give us an eight. And we just repeat this until we're down to a single value. So we read this operator, replace, evaluate that to an eight, move until we find another operator, we find this division, read the two previous values, nine divided by three, replace this with that three that we find that we get. That's the, uh, the result, the quotient. We read until we find this plus, pre two previous values, eight plus three, 11. Read the minus, eight minus 11, negative three. It's the same expression, it's the same evaluation uh, that we did on the with the infix expression, except this is much easier to write that algorithm. You iterate through until you find an operator, read the two pre previous values, those are your operands, evaluate, repeat until you're done. So much simpler to write, uh, write an expression evaluator uh, with this. Yes, you'll be doing learning objective interviews this week. You should have assumed all the TAs sent their invites by now. Um, but if, I mean, we expect some some confusion, some delay during this these first couple of weeks of adjustment. If your TA hasn't sent the interviews yet, uh, you're not going to be restricted to this week. We'll be able to have interviews next week with those TAs um, once I yell at them and get them doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I can't believe, I mean, it's Wednesday. They still don't have their calendars up. But uh, I'll, I'll deal with that after after lecture. I can give them a boot. Um, so that's how we can evaluate these postfix expressions. The problem is we usually have infix expressions that we, uh, that we want to... Uh, that we want to evaluate. We want to evaluate an infix expression because that's usually how we get our expressions, uh, just the way the world is set up. We use infix instead of postfix. Uh, but we can program something to evaluate postfix pretty easily. So what we'd like to do and what we're going to do is 
use a stack, of course, you know, uh, use a stack and uh, implement what's called the shunting yard algorithm, which is going to do what we want this to do. We want to convert infix to postfix, and then we can evaluate the postfix very simply. So if you want to evaluate an infix expression, the common strategy is to use the shunning yard algorithm to convert it to a postfix expression and then evaluate the postfix expression. Saves you a lot of headaches in uh, in what you're doing. And if you don't do that, if you uh, homebrew some other method of doing this, you're probably going to end up implementing all of the logic of the shunting yard algorithm. Anyway, you're just recreating something that's already been done. So the shunting yard algorithm, we're going to read the characters. We're going to tokenize this and read the characters one at a time, whether it's an operator, operand, or parenthesis. We're going to read them one at a time and make, uh, make decisions based on the character that we're reading. So we're going to read this left to right. If we read an operand, we're going to copy that over to the output unaltered. If we're reading an open parenthesis, we're going to push that onto a stack. If we read a closed parenthesis, we're going to pop everything off the stack and copy it to the output until we read an open paren. And if we're reading an operator, we're going to make a decision based on the precedence of the operator. We're going to look at the top of the stack. And if the top of the stack has an operator with a lower precedence, meaning that that operator should be evaluated after, uh, meaning the operator that we're looking at should be evaluated before whatever is on the top of the stack. We're going to push that operator onto the top of the stack. If it's not, if there's either a tie in precedence or what's on the top of the stack needs to be evaluated before the operator that we're looking at, then we're going to pop values off of the stack until that's no longer true or if the stack is empty and copy those values over to the output. And we'll end up with this input. We're going to get this exact output, the two expressions, the one expression with the two different representations that we saw on the previous slides. What's that look like? I'm glad you asked. So let's go through this algorithm and see exactly what this looks like, how we're going to read the input character by character, build the output. And we're going to use this big old stack right in the middle to be able to get this thing done. So let's just go through character uh, token by token and find out uh, and go through this algorithm and make our decisions based on this algorithm. So we start with an open paren. Open paren, you always just push it to the stack. No decision to be made. Operand, no decision to be made again. We just copy it right to the output. And the output, you can think of this as a queue, but I, I don't want to sell it like that because we don't really use, we never use DQ, we just use NQ. Copy it to the output. An operator, so now we have to make a, a decision. We look at the top of the stack and say, ask ourselves, is the top of the stack an operator that needs to be evaluated before the operator that I'm considering? Well, no, it's an open paren that doesn't even make sense. Let's just push this thing on the stack. Push, operand, copy to the output, close parenthesis. We're going to look at the stack and just pop operators until we reach the open paren, and then pop the open paren as well. So we're gonna copy that uh, subtraction to the minus to the output, we're going to find our open paren and get rid of our parentheses. We have an empty stack, so there's no decisions here. Just copy this, um, copy this operator to the stack. Push that onto the stack. Push an open paren to the stack. Copy an operand to the output. Plus, we're going to compare with open paren. Open paren. What's the presence of open paren? We treat that as an empty stack. Push the addition copy the nine. And finally, we have our first decision that we actually have to make a, a division. We're going to look at the top of the stack. Since the top of the stack is, is already an operator that will be evaluated after the operator that we're considering or lower precedence as I word it here. Since it's already the case, we're just going to push the division onto the stack. If this addition was multiplication, we would move the multiplication over to the output because that multiplication would need to be evaluated first. But this is how we're making our order of operation decisions. We're going to put this division on the stack on top of the addition, which means it's going to end up, no matter what else happens in this algorithm, 
the division is going to end up being moved to the output before that addition because we can't go like to the middle or the second element of a stack we can only work with the top of the stack so when we push this division we know that division is going to be evaluated before that addition which is exactly what we want with pemdas we had that plus and then a division the division will be evaluated first and that's how we make that decision using this algorithm is we check the top of the stack compare the precedences and decide whether to push onto the stack pop off of the stack uh, oh those are the two uh, either push onto the stack or pop off of the stack another operand copy it close paren so we know everything inside the parentheses we have the correct order we got the division before the addition so we're happy about that pop them off we're at the end of the input so everything that's left on the stack pop it off and copy it to the output and we arrive at that same exact expression but in postfix notation instead of infix uh, what if we have the division before the plus so when we make this decision here we would be looking at addition and then division we'd compare the precedence of those uh, of those operators and when we look at the addition we're asking ourselves is whatever's on the top of the stack does that need to be does that is that evaluated after strictly after i need to be evaluated when it's addition here and division here, that answer is no. So we're going to pop off the stack until that is the case. So we would move the division, we would pop the division off, move that to the input, or move that to the output, and then push the addition onto the stack. So we would end up with addition on the stack, the stack would be just like it is here, except this division would be over here in the output. We would have popped that over to the output. So that's how we get our order of operations. It's all strictly based on comparing to the top of the stack and, uh, and hitting this line, this line of the algorithm. This is doing all of uh, M, M dash, I guess, uh, without the parentheses. And this is doing the P in PEMDAS. Uh, that's how we're getting all of our order of operations. How do we call this algorithm? Well, I didn't, I didn't show any code for it. Um, you'd have to code it up and then call your method.